Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for tuning in today. I have an important topic that I want to talk to you about today. And the reason for that is because I've had a decent amount of conversations lately with Missing Link members and some of my one-on-one clients where they are sharing their struggles with me and their uncertainty and unknown of why they are struggling. And after they explain a little bit more about the situation, my response is always, oh, okay, yeah, that makes sense. That totally is clear as to why you would be flaring right now or why you would be having that symptom. And they're always like, I don't understand. Why? I don't, what is this? Please tell me. And I want to share why that is and also let you know that this topic is going to be relevant, of course, for people with relapsing MS, because if you have relapsing MS, that likely means that you have some flares and you have some ups and downs. There is a difference between pseudo flare and an actual flare. Other terminology is a pseudo exacerbation or a true exacerbation, a pseudo relapse or a true relapse. If you want all of the specifics on that topic, that is Missing Link Podcast episode number 117. So knowing what is causing symptoms to worsen or to flare is of course relevant for people with relapsing MS. However, it is also extremely relevant for people with progressive MS. And I just wanna share that because sometimes when we use the word relapse or trigger or flare or worsening, someone with progressive MS might exclude themselves. They might say, well, I don't have relapses or flares or worsening symptoms. I have progressive MS. It is a slow progression over time. But what we're talking about today are triggers that can cause certain symptoms to worsen. And I hate to break it to you if this is news to you, but anyone with MS, relapsing MS or progressive MS, primary or secondary, can have exacerbations, can have worsening that is temporary. It's not just a pseudo relapse or an actual relapse for people with relapsing MS. It can happen for people with progressive. Now, the differentiation here is that when you have a relapse from relapsing multiple sclerosis, that is a indication that you have new lesions, new activity on your MRI, new inflammation, and it's a new symptom. But when you have progressive MS, you won't have relapses, but it is still possible to have what we call a pseudo relapse or a pseudo flare, which is temporary worsening of any symptom. And what I really want to focus on instead of the definitions of all those things is what are those triggers? Because so often we think we might know what the trigger is, but we actually don't realize how many triggers there actually are. And if we don't realize how many triggers there are, then you'll be very confused as to why you are experiencing worsening symptoms, and then you won't know what to do to help calm it down and get back to whatever your baseline is. So I've got a list here that are just the most common, but please know that everyone is different and everyone has different triggers to their symptoms. And not only that, to make matters a bit more complicated, your triggers that you had a few years ago might be completely different now. Maybe they're not, the ones that you had a few years ago are non-existent. It's a completely new set. Or maybe there's additional triggers. So that is important to keep in mind as well. I've had several clients over the years who will say, oh, I don't have heat intolerance. And while that was true for them at one point, they actually do have heat intolerance now, but not in the classic type, which is from the sun and the heat outside. So let's just dive into it. So the first trigger that could potentially make any of your symptoms worse is stress. And let me start off by saying that some of these that I'm going to list are hopefully not new to you, but some of them I think you might actually be surprised to hear. So stress is one that is hopefully not new to you. This is a very common trigger for any MS symptom. And what I mean by trigger is that you are exposed to something and it causes any type of temporary worsening that usually goes away once the trigger is removed. So 
It could be weakness. It could be vision changes. It could be sensory changes. It could be poor balance. It could be energy fatigue. It could be anything at all. Stress is one of the sneakiest triggers because I don't know about you guys, but I can speak for myself and say that I have a very high tolerance for stress. I usually don't feel stressed until it has built up so much that it is obvious. A great example of this is I was in physical therapy school, obviously stressful, so much work, so much studying. I never felt stressed, but I hit a point where my hair was thinning clearly I'm stressed if my hair is thinning. There was no other reason for it. My nutrition was great. It was the same as it always had been. It was the stress. A few years later, I was feeling fine. I got a new job. It was really exciting. And then all of a sudden, I was hit with intense GI symptoms and issues. And I thought to myself, what the heck? Why am I feeling this? Like, why now out of nowhere? And then I realized, oh, I think I'm more stressed than I realized. And I think this is so true for a lot of us. So the reason I wanted to mention this one first is because it's so sneaky. Anytime you have a worsening symptom, just ask yourself, is there the possibility that I am stressed or anxious or overwhelmed or nervous, all of these emotions can cause temporary worsening of various symptoms. And it can be an easy one to dissipate if you have stress reduction techniques that work for you. My current favorite stress reduction technique is coloring in a coloring book. I just find that so relaxing. I love just picking whatever color I feel like. I don't know why I feel like it sounds a little childish to say that I love it, but it's so relaxing. But there was another point in my life where coloring was the last thing that I wanted to do, but I was really into gratitude and focusing intently on the things that I felt gracious for. And it put a smile on my face. It immediately brought me out of any type of stressful situation. Maybe it's breathing, focusing on your breath. Maybe it's meditation, guided or self-guided, or just calming your mind. There's lots of different strategies, and that's not really what we're talking about today, but Ask yourself, is there the possibility that I am stressed? If so, that might be why you are having a symptom that is temporary worsening for you. All right, let's move on to the next one, which is lack of sleep. This is a double-edged sword because MS can make sleep challenging, but then when sleep is challenging, other symptoms can worsen. So it's kind of like, well, what started first and how do we work around this. But another question you can ask yourself if you do notice any symptoms temporarily worsening is, how is my sleep? And there's two ways this can go. Either your sleep isn't well and you know why, or your sleep isn't well and you don't know why. So for example, if your sleep isn't well, you're not sleeping well at all, but you know that it's because you keep waking up to go to the bathroom then the issue there is more bowel or bladder rather than sleep itself. If we could quiet your bowel and bladder systems down, then you might be able to sleep the whole night. And so the treatment for that trigger of poor sleep is actually treating the bowel and bladder function. However, if you feel like, yeah, I'm getting awful sleep, I don't know why, I just can't stay asleep or I can't fall asleep. One of the best things that you can do for this trigger is to come up with a sleep schedule to fall asleep and to wake up. So my nephew right now is probably, I was gonna say two, but I think he's actually two and a half. So he's two and a half years old and he has a very strict sleep routine where He gets a bubble bath and he loves it and then he gets in his pajamas and then he goes into my sister's room and they read about two books there and then they go into his bedroom and they read another few books with him sitting in the chair and then he moves into his crib and they read a few more books there and it's this whole step-by-step process that calms him down enough to go to sleep. And he's two and a half, so sometimes it works well and other times it doesn't. But still, we should be doing that as adults as well. And yes, this might take an hour. Having a sleep routine is not just 
Let me avoid screens for 30 minutes before bed or an hour before bed. It's more than that. It is calming yourself down with various things leading up to your bedtime. And in addition to that, your waking up routine. So this could mean that when you wake up, you stay in your pajamas for X amount of time. Maybe you shower or maybe you don't. Maybe you read a book. You slowly work your way into your day. And one thing that would be a fantastic idea to have in your wake up routine is your wake up or reminder exercises. I like to call these like warm up exercises. You've been asleep for a certain amount of time. Whether it was long or short, you were at least lying down for a long time, meaning your neural pathways and your muscles are probably asleep. Like if you were to get up and move, they're sleepwalking. And so you got to move them around. You got to wake them up a bit. So that could be part of your morning routine. Moving on, one of my favorites, and this sounds so weird to say it's my favorite trigger, but it's my favorite trigger because it's easily reduced. So for example, if you have heat intolerance or cold intolerance, you can experience any type of worsening symptom. But what a lot of people don't know about this is that your core temperature needs to change only by half of a degree in order to actually see any type of change in symptoms. Half of a degree. That is nothing at all. And Not only that, but what a lot of people also don't realize is that the things that cause our core temperature to increase and decrease are way more than what we're taught. It's We're usually taught stay out of the sun and stay out of the hot temperatures, but it's so much more than that. For example, exercise increases your core temperature. Stress increases your core temperature. Illness increases your core temperature. Even if you're inside in air conditioning, if it's a hot day outside and maybe it's humid, maybe it's just sticky and gross, the barometric pressure being high can increase your core temperature. I don't know if you personally have experienced this, but I have lots of clients who have experienced being indoors in air conditioning and their symptoms are worsening even though they're inside in air conditioning and they just don't understand why. But when I ask, well, what was the temperature outside? And they give me a high number. I'm like, okay, yeah, that makes sense. And so the trick for this one is to cool your core temperature down. Sip ice cold water proactively. Put a cooling vest on or some type of cooling device or product proactively. You know, especially if you are stressed or something that it takes a little bit to get rid of. It's not just a quick fix, like taking a cold shower. It's important that you do these things proactively as well as during and after. So if you're gonna be exercising, sip ice cold water before, during, and after, or put a cooling vest on before, during, and after. So that's heat intolerance, but cold intolerance can also cause certain symptoms to worsen. In my experience, it's mostly spasticity or some form of muscle tightness that worsens, But this is a symptom that when your core temperature drops by at least half of a degree, anything can worsen, in which case bundling yourself up is one of the best ways, sipping hot water just to increase the temperature inside your body. And again, this is tricky because bundling yourself up is supposed to increase your core temperature, meaning you can have heat intolerance in the dead of winter. So many people will say, oh my gosh, I got so fatigued and I didn't know why. And I was like, well, what were you wearing? Like, well, it's winter. So I had my biggest coat on and I had a few sweaters on underneath that. I was like, okay, yeah, that makes sense. Even though it's winter, your core temperature was increasing too much. So again, if you're noticing worsening symptoms, ask yourself, is there the possibility that I could either be overheating internally or cooling off? internally. Either one can cause temporary worsening of symptoms, and it's such an easy fix. It's just changing the temperature of your internal body. Next up, and this is a really important one, is nutrition and hydration. As I mentioned earlier, a lot of people with MS can, not always, but can experience some variation of bowel and bladder dysfunction, meaning maybe incontinence or urgency or frequency. And 
If you have that symptom, I found that it's very common to be underhydrated. And I can't blame you. I understand that your mind is probably working in a way where you're thinking, okay, I I'm going to have to pee like five times at night. Let me not drink any water. Or I'm going to have to keep getting up to go to the bathroom and my balance isn't great. I might fall. Let me not drink any water. So I get it. But knowing the body, that is actually worse. Being underhydrated is a trigger for worsened incontinence. And you might think like, well, how? There's no water in me to pee out. But yes, it is actually a trigger. So making sure that you are staying hydrated, even if that just means tiny sips throughout the day, you don't have to stop and sip and chug eight ounces of water, small, tiny sips throughout the day, but stay hydrated. Similarly, nutrition. And nutrition is different for everyone. I am not going to share my favorite or best nutrition plans for people with MS because I don't know that there is one. Everyone is affected by nutrition different, but what I do know is that when you fall away from an overall healthy diet, symptoms can worsen. I have patients who tell me that they know that they had too much salt yesterday because their feet are swollen, or they know that they had too much XYZ because their balance is worse, or they're feeling jittery, or their fatigue is worse. And so you know your body best, but pay attention to your nutrition. Generally try to have an overall healthy diet, staying away from sodium, from salt, you know, the basics that we all know, MS or not, but also pay attention to what specific food triggers you might have. Everyone is different. So that can be a really important piece of information to know about your body so that you can then take action. Next up is menopause and any form of a menstrual cycle, not just menopause, can cause some more heat in our body. It can cause inflammation temporarily, and that can cause a worsening of symptoms. So when you are going through menopause or your menstrual cycle, making sure that you're taking extra steps to lay low, reduce any stress, reduce your core temperature can be really helpful. Next is illness. And this one, kind of similar to stress, can be very sneaky. We like to think that we know when we have an illness, an infection, a virus, bacteria, and most of the time we do. But they can be so sneaky, specifically UTIs. Now, some people will get a UTI and they know immediately, but I have a lot of clients that have asymptomatic UTIs, meaning their symptoms are worsening. And This isn't just a temporary worsening as in just a day or two, but it might be a week or a month and they're just not improving and they have no idea why. We're kind of running through this list. Are you stressed? How is your nutrition? How is your hydration? How is your core temperature? Are you going through menopause or are you in a menstrual cycle? No, 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 no. Well, then what the heck is happening? So often there is an underlying brewing illness And this could be a UTI, it could be anything, any form of a flu, a cold, it could be allergies. I have so many clients who have allergies and have worsened symptoms when their allergies are at their peak. And so if you feel like, well, I don't know what this could be, my answer is no to all these triggers that you're mentioning, test yourself or go get tested for a UTI or maybe get blood work and see if there is any other type of infection that is happening. Lastly, and this one's important too, because with MS, there's lots of different symptoms that can lead to different medications or just trying out new medications. Whether you are having a new medication, starting to take a new medication, or it is a group of medications. I'm assuming if you're taking medications, it's not just one. Most of my clients with MS are taking anywhere from five pills to like 15 pills every single day. It could be a new medication that's added in or just a new medication on its own, 
or the group of medications that you're taking, the combination of them, can sometimes cause increased symptoms temporarily. And so that could be another place that you could look as a trigger and reach out to your neurologist or your physiatrist and see what's going on there. Is there anything that you're taking either on its own or in combination with something else that could be causing this type of symptom that you are experiencing? I know that this was a lot. This episode was a little bit longer than I was intending, but I wanted to be able to share some of the most common triggers and not only that, but what you can do about them. So I hope you found this helpful and insightful, and I hope you took notes because when we are experiencing temporary worsening, it's so easy to forget all of this. And so I would actually encourage you to write down these triggers on a sheet of paper and then put it away somewhere. But then if you ever are experiencing worsening of any anything, any symptom that you have, pull out this paper and just run through it. Is there a chance that you're overheating? Is there a chance you have a UTI? Is there a chance that you're stressed, that you're underhydrated? Go through all of them. And my best bet is that at least one of them, you're going to say, oh yeah, I think this could be it. And then implement the strategy that we talked about. And as I mentioned in the beginning, there are more triggers than this, but these are some of the most common ones that are really important to keep your eye out for because it can be really easy fixes if you know what the trigger is. Lastly, I just want to share that once you know what the trigger is and you implement some of these strategies, the symptoms can lessen very quickly. It can lessen within really just a few minutes, especially when we're talking about things like heat intolerance. Or they can start to lessen over the span of a week or two. And that is more so if you do experience a UTI or any type of infection, allergies, flu, usually you won't get back to where you were prior to the infection until it is fully cleared and gone. If you are ever unsure of the trigger and it's making you a little nervous, you don't know what's going on, always reach out to your healthcare provider. Your neurologist is probably going to be your best bet, but just let them know it's happening and they at least will be able to reassure you yet that yes, this is something that you can just manage at home, implement these strategies, or hey, why don't you come on in, we'll test you for an infection, or we'll give you some steroids if it is actually a true relapse, if you have relapsing MS. Thanks so much for tuning in today. I'll see you next time. And if you like videos like this, please remember to press the subscribe button, press like, and comment below.